From conception to childbirth. What changes and what remains the same? This is part of what I discuss in my latest book, Life's Journey, a guide from conception to growing up, growing old and natural death. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And when they are nicely ordered, you really see that they are pairs. Except for the last one. The last pair is sometimes not a real pair. XX is for females and for males it's XY. And XY is not a real pair because Y is smaller. So how does a new generation come along? A father and a mother, male and female, have their 23 pairs of chromosomes. Then they split them in half. So each one has 23 and 23 in their egg cells and their sperm cells. And that creates together a new set of 23 pairs in the new generation. I simulated that here to show what happens if this is the father and that the mother and they have only one child. Then it depends on, more or less random, whether the next generation will be male or female. I discuss this kind of issues in Excel simulations, if you are interested, otherwise I'm just going to do it. And you will see that when each time I press F9, you will see it creates new generations. And these are all females. And this is the Y chromosome that happened to stay here, but it did not go to the next generation. In this case it did, for four generations. So we are going to see how that applies to human conception. What happens during fertilization? The egg cell has 23 chromosomes, the sperm cell has 23 chromosomes, and together in fertilization th those become pairs again in the baby cell. So here it shows what happens in the fertilized egg cell. The embryo keeps growing and growing. So you might wonder when can fertilization happen? Usually we have a cycle, the female de determines that, of 28 days more or less. There are variations of course. Uh, menstruation is the beginning of the cycle. And then in the middle of the cycle the egg cell gets released and then the lining of the uterus starts growing. And if nothing happens, no fertilization, then the lining breaks down, that's a new menstruation. That is partly regulated by estrogen levels and progesterone levels. You can also show this in a circle. So when menstruation starts then almost 14 days before the next ovulation and then the lining will gradually break down again. Each 28 days one of the two ovaries releases usually one egg cell called ovulation on day 14 approximately. But there are ranges. A woman can become pregnant if she has sexual intercourse with a day or two before or after the egg is released. Since sperm can live as long as five days, intercourse between four days before the release and 24 hours after, a sperm cell will be able to fertilize an egg. In that window, fertilization is possible. Outside that window, no. But again, those are averages and cycles are not always the regular way. So what happens after fertilization? Then the growing embryo goes on its way to the lining in the uterus. The days that are mentioned here are what they call fetal days. Doctors usually talk about gestational age. It refers to the length of the time since the first day of a woman's last period. So when the doctor says the gestational age is four weeks, it just means that, he has been, that it has been four weeks since the last menstrual period started. So in the case here to the left, we are talking about fetal age. It refers to the real age of the developing baby, 
counting from the estimated date of conception. Since ovulation usually takes place two weeks after menstruation, the fetal age is typically two weeks less than the gestational date. What happens next? That is a very complicated process that we are beginning to understand a little bit more. But there are still so many mysteries left. Because from one cell we end up with millions of cells and they are specialized for specific functions in the human body. So what changes during this process? A lot is happening, milestones actually. On week three, that is a fetal age, the heart has begun to pulsate weekly. Week four, arm and leg buds, even hands and feet, but they are still mitten-like. That means they are not well separated yet. The neural tube is closed by now. Week five, essential organs have begun to form. Week eight, all organs are functioning now. Week nine, we begin to see a human face with widely separated eyes and separated fingers and toes by now. Week 10. The genitalia have clearly formed into male or female. The eyelids close and will not reopen until the 26th week after conception. This process is one continuum. Each human being is genetically the same human being at every stage of its life's journey. In spite of clear changes in appearance, it's a human being from the very beginning. Not completely yet, but definitely in the making. At the moment of conception, the new being could essentially say, I am a boy or I am a girl. And that's how it will stay. Human life is a journey that does not start halfway. When does human life begin? Many people ask that question. From fertilization on, life's journey is a continuum. So there is no such stage as a pre-embryonic phase, let alone a pre-human stage in this process. Even when we use different terms such as embryo, fetus or unborn baby, in all such instances we are referring to steps in one long continuous developmental growth process that starts with a fertilized egg Outli outfitted with human DNA in 23 pairs of human chromosomes. What stays the same in spite of all the changes in appearance? In we at week 4, all these organs are already there. Is there any reason to think this living embryo is not human? Since the embryo arises from a human mother and a human father, what species could it be other than human? The newly conceived human embryo is biologically and genetically one of us. The embryo is not a part of the mother, which is very obvious when the embryo happens to be in a petri dish, but it's rather made from part of the mother, her egg cell, and part of the father, a sperm cell. So what changes and what does not? What remains the same during the entire process of adding, replacing and losing cells is the person's identity. The person's soul. Humans have the capacity to undergo biological change without losing their identity. Our body keeps changing, but our soul does not. The soul is the identity during the entire process. The human soul. That's why we can say, I could dream before I was born. What is the value of human life? I am going to quote Abraham Lincoln. When he talked about slavery, he said the following. You say A is white and B is black? It is color then. The lighter having the right to enslave the darker? Take care. By this rule you are to be slave to the first person you meet with a fairer skin than your own. You mean the whites are intellectually the superiors of the blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them? Take care again. By this rule you are to be slave to the first person you meet with an intellect superior to your own. This is a very valuable point that Abraham Lincoln is making. So we are going to compare slavery with abortion. 
When is slavery allowed? Some people think when one's skin is darker. That's basically the point of Abraham Lincoln. Or when one's intelligence is lower. Or when someone has more poverty. Or when someone has a lower fitness. Or when someone has a weaker power. Or when someone has an education that is not as good as your own. Is slavery allowed then? Of course not. Never. Because what we have here are standards that are relative. Moral standards are absolute. Slavery is never allowed. We could say something similar about abortion. Abortion has different gradations in it, people think. So they say, when is it allowed? Before implantation in the uterus. That's what some say. Before the heart starts beating. Before limbs start moving. Before the brain starts functioning. Before senses are working. Before breathing starts on its own. That's when the baby is born. Is abortion allowed? To any of these points, again, never. Why not? Because these are standards that are relative. Moral standards are absolute. So abortion kills human life, no matter at what stage. There is no point in this continuum where embryos spontaneously transform into human beings. They are human from the very beginning conception. Therefore, there is no specific stage in this continuum where abortion is not ending or killing a human life. Our value is not determined by our size. Think of this analogy. To protect the life of bald eagles, we also need to protect their eggs. For they will be bald eagles, or they are already bald eagles. Or take this analogy. The monarch butterfly goes through various appearances, from egg to caterpillar to pupa, and finally to a mature butterfly. But it remains the same entity all the way. So, many people play a game of words. They don't want to use the word abortion because that means killing. So, they redefine it as a healthcare issue. But it has nothing to do with the health of the mother, let alone the health of her unborn baby. Others redefine it as therapeutic solution. But the word therapeutic means healing, but abortion does not heal anything. Instead, it kills innocent lives. Abortion has been called a reproductive right. But it's not about a woman's right to reproduce, but at best her right to either continue or discontinue her pregnancy. How could a reproductive right ever allow for abortion after the reproduction has already taken place? If it's not your body, it is not your decision. Abortion. So should we be pro-life or pro-choice? Remember that billboard in Manhattan, it said the most dangerous place for African Americans is in the womb. They count for 60% of the city's abortions. This is not a racial remark, it is actually protecting African Americans. Interestingly enough, pro-choice activists are highly selective in their pro-choice positions. They are pro-choice in choosing abortion. But they are usually not pro-choice in matters of gun control, or death penalty, or free speech, or slavery. There is no pro-choice in morality. Morality obliges us to go for what is good and what is right. No matter what, whether we like it or not, whether we feel it or not, or whether others enforce it or not. My life is in your hands, says the new life. This and many other issues I discuss in my book Life's Journey that you can order from angelicopress.com. This is what is in it. It has a rich series of issues discussed from conception to growing up, growing old, to natural death. And this is the section that I discuss there, but much more extensively and with much more information for your benefit.